Hello, everyone, and welcome to Awkward Ascent. I'm your host, Christy Pritchard. Join us in our conversations around consciousness, connection, spiritual growing pains, and psychedelic therapy. Today on the show, I have Chris McCann, who's a business and thought leader, went through his own awakening, and now helps people and companies align their life and business with their purpose. Welcome to the show, Chris. It's so great to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's good to see your face. How are you? Yes, good to see yours. I'm doing well. We we're just talking about how unrested we are with all the craziness that's going on in the in the cosmos right now. But other than that, well, and how are you doing? I'm glad to know that it's not an isolated event and that the sleep has certainly been choppy. And of course, there's the dog who doesn't like, you know, here in the States, we have July 4th and all the fireworks are going on. Oh my God. And yeah. I mean, the dog, it's like if I could have given him three or four spliffs, it's still... Yeah. No. Oh my God, no. We didn't have the fireworks this year. And I'm so grateful because for two, I'm grateful that they canceled them and the reason behind that because of my ancestry personally. And three, or and what that was one, and two is because my dog does the same and she'll hide under the bed for about a day and she will freak out and no amount of CBD oil or anything will calm her. And it's just, I feel bad for all the dogs. Like, I don't know a single dog who's like sweet fireworks. Like, yeah, bring it on. No, that doesn't happen. So let's talk uh, about your ancestry. That's interesting. Oh, um, yes. I have Cree First Nations on my mom's side. So her mom's great grandfather, Sir James Douglas, married Amelia Douglas, who was Cree. And he was also mulatto himself. So I have that as well. My family is a million generations back from British Columbia. And he was the first governor of BC. I don't know if I mentioned that part, did I? Oh. Yes. Yeah. Sir James Douglas was the very first governor of this province. So that is my ancestry. Very, very cool. Very big shoes. You know, it's interesting. And so Meredith, who you just met my wife, um, for a couple of years now, Canada has been showing up as a place for me to move mm. and I don't understand it. Interesting. I don't have. And showing up how, like, how is it showing up for you? Chris, you're going to move to Canada. Yeah, like, like signs it's, from above it's, or just it's, like. <laughs> like, like your audience, Chris, you're moving to ah, Canada. I'm like, what is it? cold there i don't do cold it's really not actually cold not where i am anyways um but it is changing a lot right now politically so I, i'm personally wanting to leave because it's the evolution of canada is not what it was initially so i'm personally like get me the heck out of here but you know if you ever come here we can swap like <laughs> Little housing. Got, I'm all for that. Monica is a wonderful little bubble. Yeah, I actually went to high school in the Palisades. Right. Yeah. I did yeah, we over so. Friday night with some friends. Um, but I know that you have a tie to Topanga. Yes, and, I do. Uh, yes. Our, Very our, big tie to We're there as well. And, you know, that certainly you know, gave me a good foundation for our conversation. Cool. But Mexico feels really. Fun. Yeah. Yeah, Mexico it? feels amazing right now. It's like it's, the radar is there and the excitement is there. And now I'm just like trying to put the pieces in place to see if it's actually feasible. Speaking of the conversation, because of your background with being a spiritual and thought leader and business mentor and how you combine the two and helping people find their intended purpose, I'm really um, interested to know more about that. And also your ceremonies. I'd really like to touch in to see how you got involved in that and the pivot that you'd made from traditional business into more spiritually minded business coach, because that's always an interesting pivot. And it's it's happening a lot more now. Thank goodness that people are awakening. So yay us, yay humanity. <laughs> I'll kick it off by just asking how you got involved in the spiritual community and with your transition from regular 3d so yeah i'll start out with a big asterisk in front of it and i'm just a recovering narcissist <laughs> okay i didn't mean to laugh like that but i've never heard anyone say that before it was quite shocking okay let's we'll get really clear about that okay so, amazing we're, we're moving all i've forward. never heard that before Better, sorry for the outburst of last you're just your face was glowing when you said it too okay. <laughs> well i think it's just being aware of that yes, you know um that sure. entity and all forms of self-centeredness and directing my attention to the work at hand. And I, I certainly have had elevated levels of self historically. Uh, things come fairly easily to me. You know, I never finished college. I mean, hell, I barely even started. I had, um, I had a radio show in school. I blew up my knee playing football, American football. And I was like, well, what do I want to do? And what I ended up doing was marrying my first wife, um, who is black and there weren't too many, um, 
black people, let alone black females in Marquette, Michigan, which is fairly close to Canada. Um, just a different part of, you know, where you are. And she showed up in my dorm room, um, with this like plaid skirt, black leather boots, and, um, an armful of Rolling Stones albums. Awesome. I like the those are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was hooked. Um, so, you know, at the ripe old age of 20, I'd already had my first child at 22. I had my second. Wow. Yeah. 24, I was divorced and then began a 15 year experiment into the land of, well, I'd like to say I was cloonying it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and already but, out thrown down. Right? Yeah. And Clooney had a lot of money and I was still trying to figure out what, <laughs> what I grew up. Right. Yeah. It's just the experiments. Uh, I just, I realized right around 37, 38 that it just, it wasn't cute anymore. And my concerted and concentrated efforts into the metaphysical began with a lunch that I was having in Chicago with my, not a business partner, but a, a gentleman that I worked with and he's classic Brooks brothers, khakis, blue blazer sort of guy and worked for large software firms. And we were talking about religion and spirituality. And he's like, you know, Chris, have you ever heard of the Akashic records? Mm -hmm. And I said vaguely, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you mean. And he told me about his relationship with Linda Howe, who was in Chicago and Linda had developed this pathway portal. She's a very grandmotherly sword who had developed you know, like a certain technology, if you will, you know, to be able to access the Akashic records. And it's a very, uh, I don't want to call it a narrow prism, but it's very heart centered and there's a very strict set of rules and a framework in which to operate. Huh. And I was like, this is Brad tell me about this. Interesting. Yeah. But of course, you know how things work. You know, I get back to Santa Monica and I walk into the yoga studio and the owner of that studio, Effie, who's this just brilliant French woman. She's like, you know, we have this woman coming in to do an Akashic Records reading for a group of people. And I thought of you and thought you might be interested in it. I'm interested. Okay. That's only the calling. Yes. 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 <laughs> And so, you know, at this point, you know, here we move from Chicago, we get a place in Santa Monica and we have access to the beach and life is just jiving uh, and vibing really, really high. And I wanted to understand how to maximize things going well, because in my experience in life to that point, things didn't always go well. There are peaks and valleys and ups and downs and you'd have money or not, or you'd be in a relationship or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, we get to the event. And there's probably eight people sitting in the circle. And then Helen Vonderheide, who is just a dear friend and teacher of mine at this point, she sits down and she's like, well, Chris, why don't, why don't you go first? If that's okay with the group. And the group said, yes. And so I started with this. I said, look, he said, everything in my life is going really well. Said, you know, my marriage is great. My relationship with my kids is great. My work is going well. And I want to understand how to like take advantage of everything just lining up the way that it is. Take advantage. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that when I said that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and so of course, and then she starts to talk and as she opened her mouth and spirits moving through her, everything else has disappeared. Wow. And as I'm, as I'm saying this, I just, I feel a lightness just come over me. Yeah. Beautiful session. The next day I fired my psychotherapist and said, what's past her along? I just want to focus on, you know, what's in front of me. And that was my current level of understanding. And maybe three, four sessions in, you know, with Helen, it was like, you know, I think I'm supposed to learn how to actually do this. She's like, great. She's like, I've been waiting for you to ask. Like I've yeah. been getting the same thing, but I wasn't going to bring it to you. And so from there, you know, I went through trainings, et cetera. And then I, of course, I thought, you know, because I, I was like no longer a software sales guy. I just want to go be this spiritual guru, yeah. person, right? <laughs> just put a bunch of crystals in the backyard and everything's going to line up. <laughs> yeah. That uh, I didn't find that to be particularly rewarding in working with people and generally it was always about romantic relationships or as the same level of stuckness. Mm. Now. Around then, I also got a call from 
my boss who works with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Carlos Warder. And he's like, I want you to come to this next retreat that Carlos is doing. You know, Carlos lives outside of San Diego with his family. He just turned 75 back in May. Oh, wow. He's a medical doctor as well as a psychiatrist and went to school in Chile, but also did some work in, at Harvard and picked up a degree there as well. And he's been working with entheogenic substances for well over 50 years. Wow. And so my deal with art was fine, but I'm not going to do this until you and I are no longer working together. And so that day finally came. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, coincidentally, there was a retreat about a month later. So I was actually, I was in Hollywood the day of the retreat, of course, of me being self-important. So he was like, fine, I could be there, but I'm going to arrive late because I had this, you know, previous engagement and I was recording, it was in a recording session. And I rented a, a fancy little German car and sped down to Vista, California. I've got a Sturgill Simpson cranked up on the stereo, <laughs> just, you know, vibing really high. And I walk into this room at his house and me, I'm pretty high energy. And particularly before I got my meditation game dialed in and he was like, da, 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 da. and he's like, well, who are you? I'm like, well, I'm a healer and I do this in the records. And he looked at me and he's like, Oh, so now we have a healer. <laughs> this, yeah. you know, took this machete to me and was. Oh, you know, I had no idea what hit me. Well, that was the first time I did ayahuasca was that weekend. Yeah. Was what, maybe five years ago or so. Yeah. And five or six years. And I went through, it started on his property, Christy. And I was up in the top of the hill and I wanted to see the ocean. And I get to the top of the hill and I hear, Go to the tree. Well, who am I to argue? <laughs> but I grabbed my blanket, grabbed my belongings, and I went down to this tree and laid underneath it and had this incredibly somatic experience. Mm. The, the journey began with, you need to let go. Well, I don't know how to let go. Do you mind if I show you? Not at all. And it went from, okay, first you relax the top of your head to that. And then you relax your forehead and relax your ears. And I'm hanging onto the ground below me for dear life. Like the planet's going to slip away from me. Yeah. And was able to go through this full body release and relax into the experience. And from there, it was like, you're not Chris, the father, you're not Chris, the son, you're not Chris, the employer. You're not Chris, the entrepreneur, and was given this very visceral experience of disidentification. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how long it lasted, but I he was probably just screaming at you. Kind of. Oh, it was like finally. Just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I didn't need to be any of those things or put on any masks. And you know, I, I so. <laughs> his wife, Carolina, as we're, you know, starting the integration later that night and then the following day, she's like, Chris, do you remember when you told me what I want by? And I was like, no, I have no idea. And she's like, well, I wanted to make sure because it was hot that you had plenty of water. And you said, I know the tree's telling me what to do. And you just laid back down. Like, <laughs> oh, I love it. That's awesome. Amazing. And so many, many, many retreats later, as we were talking about dancing, you know, coming into this recording, maybe it was like three or four retreats ago. And that is a beautiful experience and not always clear as to what we're being administered when we're there. Right. And he's a, uh, he's a master. Through and they, they found me dancing topless across the property with my headphones on and an eye mask over here to Chopin. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, I love it. <laughs> oh, I can dance too. It was amazing. Yeah. So all this work, when I was thinking about what you know, like a good topic would be coming into this call, and it was slowing down to speed up and also getting to a point where it's like, maybe I'm just tired of thinking that I have to fix things about myself. Yeah. Yes. And it, it can be easy for me or for people who are really like to experience these types of non-ordinary states of consciousness to use it as a form of escapism. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, yeah. and to not allow for the medicine 
the settling in of the experience. Settle in. And so peyote for me, and when I'm able to help facilitate peyote ceremonies, that was a very, very different experience and, and very heavy. And, and now it's, you know, I've done quite a bit of it with my friend Sleepy Eye. And I did it by accident once as a teenager, a very small amount. Yeah, it was at a Tibetan New Year's celebration in Los Angeles. And I was a very famous person and I will not say their name, but I'll tell you after the call. And it was for a movie rap too. That was very popular in the nineties. And there was a tent that was strictly off limits to us kids, but the adults were like off into the meadows and tripping about and getting really sick. And so one of the kids and I snuck into the tent and had a little sippy sip, but what's this? <laughs> well, like a day later, I was like, what the shit was that? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And what's it was a really long time, as far as I recall, it was like 20, 30 years ago. So I don't, yeah, but okay. yeah, but I haven't done it since like, and I, I'm curious to try again. What is your experience with it? That's my only real recollection of it as well as just me. So I, I <laughs> met, I had met Adam, uh, probably four years ago, Adam Uribe and his, his movement, if you will, is, is the red earth movement. Um, he's outside of San Diego as well. And I was working with a friend of mine at the time on a technology startup that was meant to marry entheogenic substances, starting with CBD because it was, you know, legal here in California at the time and the THC with doctors. And so if you're suffering from this, this, and this, this might be the right product for you or consider right. this and we'll match yeah. with the therapist. It was an idea that was slightly ahead of its time. Yeah. Um, and. I had had a dream prior to that, and I explained this to my friend after I had it, where I was in a van and I was in the desert. I was a passenger on the right side, and it was nightfall, and the stars were there. The um, I don't call them mountains, but the red hills were certainly there. And there was an indigenous man um, standing by the side of the road with his arms crossed in a ceremonial garb. And as the van's going by slowly, he's just watching me, and I'm watching him. And I explained this dream to my friend and he's like, well, it's interesting, Chris, because I'm going to introduce you to a friend of mine and we'll see if it's the same guy. Oh, wow. <laughs> interesting. And yeah, a couple of weeks cool. later, yeah. show up and there he was. Awesome. I love that. And that began my relationship with his community and his farm, uh, down in, uh, Escondido. And from there, he introduced me to his brother, Sleepy Eye, uh, La Frambois, who is, um, He's Dakota and Seneca and uh, is a direct descendant of Sitting Bull. He is a strong, strong, strong lineage. Amazing. And so this was maybe the, when I first, when I first met Sleepy, it was the second or third teepee ceremony that I had done with Adam and his folks. And there was this guy in this hoodie smoking cigarettes with a pot belly. He's just kind of in the background. And I'm like looking at my friend around and I'm like, who is this guy? She's like, oh no, it's Adam's friend. And you go, okay. And so we get into the teepee and I see Adam sitting to the right and he's got the, uh, the water drum in front of him and then in walks sleepy eye and Christy, when he stood up, he was like 20 feet tall. <laughs> oh, <wow. Holy> <laughs> shit. <laughs> energetically or like, are we talking? He was just really tall. <laughs> just energetic. No, he's, he's maybe five, three. Yeah. Five, three. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, energy speaks volumes. This is just beautiful, beautiful guy. And we have a, like a really strong um, relationship and we're allies in, in every sense. And I was allowed to be the fireman for the first time in that ceremony. And I know that that's something that's not passed on lightly. It's a significant responsibility and very humbling. And I come to life when I'm serving and it's like we're cleaning up. You know, if someone's getting well in front of the fire, like I have, it, it, I feel good cleaning that up and, and making sure that people are okay. Wonderful. The, the interesting thing about that particular medicine for me is how tied and connected to, you know, mother earth it is. Mm -hmm. And we're gathering groundhog dirt because it's clean and it's pure because of the way that they use their, their paws and their claws. Uh, yeah. But again. That's what we build the altar from. And when we're watching the sun come up over the mountains so that we can set up the teepee accordingly, right? Where the, the, the skirt opens, right? Or grandmother's skirt opens to where the sun comes up the following morning. And the first time we raised the teepee together, there was a dove sitting on a rock about 300 yards out. 
but in the shadows. It was interesting to see a dove sitting there and we noticed it and we're watching it and it's like, well, yeah, but usually the, you know, like a bird would be in the sun. You can't make this stuff up. But the minute we got the teepee raised, the dove comes flying down and then circles for about 20 minutes. Oh, wow. I'm just amazing. I love that. And in my experience in that particular ceremony, no matter where I've sat in the teepee itself, is like, this is a spaceship. It is. Well, I mean, they're technically kind of similar shape to pyramids, which are like huge with their technology and a lot more than we give them credit for most of right. the like, and I've seen the ground, like, yeah. back in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And know that we're on a path, right? There's a path that's clearly, you know, set out for, you know, that particular work. And to feel and, and be with and experience the ancestors in such a, a visceral way, you know, the ones that are here, the ones that are way over there found and i find that medicine for me to be incredibly grounding and for someone who loves to spend so much time there in the ethers yeah and coming back there feels really good and you still have some hallucinogenic experiences i i have but what i'm serving and uh, in my role as the fireman is you know in play uh, my knees don't get sore Right. Because you're, you're awake and you're, you're paying attention to the fire and it's just an incredible, incredible experience. Yeah. Sounds incredible. Definitely. And yeah. your path from connecting from all these people. I just, it's amazing how one, one meeting opens up a whole door and it's, you keep following that and your path toward healing and everything are just expanding. I, I don't like to just call it healing because I don't like to get focused too much on the healing. I like to like expansion to me feels more appropriate a lot of the time. Why is it there's something wrong? That's it. And for me, it's it's been a lot more of expansion personally lately. And but it's funny you but when you're expanding internally and with your own process, your your physical reality and the people in it also greatly expand. So it's really, I love hearing your your path and it's happening to me as well right now. And it has it happens to everyone. It's just like, boom. And then all of a sudden, all of these opportunities and other doors open. And as soon as you walk through that first, that first entrance way into the rest, it's amazing what starts opening. But I loved hearing how you've met all these different. Yeah. And it just keeps getting better. Yeah. Right. And even better feels like the, the wrong, but it's just life it's evolving yeah coming richer and yeah. with deeper experiences and more profound you know i was having dinner the other night with meredith our son is in chicago with his biological father for the rest of the month and just the way the sun just kind of hit her face as we're sitting there talking you know, i was like wow little moment i don't know that i would have appreciated that 10 years yeah ago. fair yeah yeah stacking these types of moments uh on top of each other and not feeling like there's something that I have to do. Yeah. And being, I was thinking last night, uh, I don't know what I was reading, but something got me off on the idea of swimming upstream versus swimming downstream and yeah. you know, the river's the river. It's okay. It's always going to do what a river does. And there are moments if you're spawning, so to speak, or you're creating where you do need to swim upstream into a place that's very familiar and that you have a genetic tie and an ancestral tie to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, downstream is just so. Downstream is just so nice. I know. I actually wrote that in an email to somebody not that long ago. I was like, I'm going to swim down, downstream for a little while. It's my my time. I have been working really hard oh. at, towards what feels like going against the current. And right now it just feels really aligned for me to flip in the other direction and go with the current and just float for a little bit because we need that. And so the conflict that I began to experience was with work and and balancing the the spiritual aspects and wanting to go do this or to just pack everything up and go to Mexico or <laughs> yeah. get a little place in Topanga and just and hang out and just trust that whoever is supposed to be supported or assisted would just show up. And so I got really fixated and fascinated on that. And I was having that conversation with Carlos and I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Like I. I know that there are tasks, just someone tell me what I'm supposed to go do and I'll go do it. Yeah, right? I know that feeling. And, and another friend of mine just last week had told me, he's like, I've never met someone who's evolved so fast. Like any neuropathway that you are trying to create, 
He's like, you're yeah. It's like, okay. <laughs> and you know, and explaining this to Carlos one day and he's like, do it at work. And I was like, oh, is it really that easy? <laughs> and so that, you know, that, well, you know, now I'm doing things at work that I've never done before. And my new boss told me that he's like, you're going to, you're going to do more. And I didn't know what he meant at the time. But what's been really helpful for me in making that transition, and I still have a, a, a strong client base, if you will, or folks that I work with um, independently and different groups that I help facilitate and retreats, et cetera. But the work is the work. Yeah. Right? And it's like, hey, you go up to the mountain proverbially and come back down and you go to the marketplace and that's where the job is. And with my current organization, I'm given a lot of flexibility and space to operate in a certain way and it addresses the whole person. Right. And it's really easy as a sales leader to get fixated on, you need to hit your number. What do you need to do? And I just, I'm not one who's going to live in spreadsheets, Yeah. but if I understand what's important to you as a person mm -hmm. and using language that meets folks where they are and as opposed to esoteric metaphysical concepts or talking about the divine masculine to, you know, someone who's 25 years in sales, it's like, I don't give it. I'm just yeah. <laughs> I have my number. <laughs> and so and meeting people where they are, it opened up a lot of space for me to begin to marry all aspects. I don't say both but to marry all aspects together. And maybe there's one way that I can help support Doug, or maybe there's somebody else that's, you know, going through a crisis in terms of who they want to be and marriage is falling apart, et cetera. And there are other ways to be able to help there too. Yeah. And it's fine, Christy, that the more I just shut up and listen and support and trust that however spirit moves through, moves through. Uh, that they find our relationship, our working relationship to be beneficial. And we may not always have the best numbers. We tend to do pretty well. But if I walk out of here in the next three years, two years, five years, whatever that might be, and know that 10 to 15 years down the road, someone is going to think, you know, I used to work with this guy. And if it hadn't been for this experience that I had here, this wouldn't have happened. Right. Yeah. And I don't even know. The blessing it. prophecy of it all. <laughs> and, and just serving. Yeah. That's why I'm most alive. And so now it's, you know, the folks that I am working with, uh, my, my client base at one point was largely females, like disproportionately so. It was like 82% to 18%. And we can remove spirituality from the conversation. And like coaching, even as a term, doesn't feel good to me. Like we'll call it like a conversation. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A results, a results generating conversation. Right. I like that. And, and, um, and being able to help. And it's fascinating, um, to watch and be able to participate in how one subtle shift can change everything for someone. Absolutely. There's someone I'd worked with who is Ukrainian. He had served in the Russian military. He's in the technology space. He's just a wonderful guy. And this was before, you know, that part of the world started to, well, go through labor pains, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to minimize. No, what's going no. On at all. It's, yeah. It's like something's being born and it's, it's you know, maybe Birth, the birthing canal. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And what kept showing up because I will access some of the more psychic things that tend to come through. And it's like, I just, I see you in Poland and I'm not entirely sure what's going on. This guy, the day after the invasion, got on a plane, went to Poland and just started serving. And you know, they bought ambulances, medical supplies. Wow. This guy just showed up and served oh, yeah. in yeah. a big way. And it was like, Amazing. if ever there was a man, it's Sergey. And, and, you know, I'm just trying to be one myself. So it's, it's me to have these opportunities um, that we have, because I know what is his own wholeness process rather than healing, but his wholeness is my wholeness and vice versa. Had very meaningful conversations with my father of late and a lot of 
ancestral things have popped up over the past few years, particularly because of the teepee ceremony and working with peyote. Yeah. And it's very much tied to the ancestors. And my paternal grandmother um, kept showing up and it's like, well, let's just talk to her and, and see what she has going on. So I had uh, just kind of closed my eyes and brought her in and we started having a dialogue. And it was around the notion of how and she passed away when I was young, but we were always really close. And she had a hard life. And before I went back to Michigan to go spend time with my family a couple of weeks ago is when I sat and, you know, it was really persistent, just like messages or a sense of knowing and was given a sense of the unilateral relationship between ancestors and descendants in, in all directions and how not only did I see her for her true nature. And she showed up to me after she passed away five years later. Oh, wow. And that's what kind of instigated a lot of this for me. I bet I was going to say, yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> yeah. And how she also saw me mm. and that there still was work to do in terms of the bloodline and the lineage and being able to help heal and that my own wholeness and efforts and self-development and self-actualization were also that for my father, for my siblings, for my aunts and uncles and cousins and right, and yeah, everyone show up. Yeah. Yeah. No self-importance, just knowing that if I continue to show up the best that I can, yeah. that that's enough. Yeah, definitely. And the ripple effect is is mm -hmm. huge. And even does the blood to me, because I have so little of it, I still through connections that we create and and keep in our lives, those are transformed even just through. So it's not to me, to me, it's not particularly genetic, but I, I can sense the ripple effect because all of my cousins and everyone, they're not blood related. So, um, but there is a ripple effect because now I'm having conversations with my step cousins um, about, I don't even like to call them that because they've they're just family, but with them about, you know, about my experiences and then it gets them curious and they're really, their interest has peaked. Even my uncle wants to try DMT. So I was just like, yes, this is yeah. happening. Like, and once they see the positive transformation that's been happening with me and, and my opening and willingness to talk about it, then it's amazing to see how people are like, oh, and, and I do believe too, that since we're born into certain families, that, that is a part of our ancestry. I, I've, think that that wasn't by accident you know that's definitely by design so um for me my cousins i know we have more history plus we're the only other russians on vancouver island essentially which is just <laughs> weird <laughs> with no blood relation it's just like our whole family it's so funny but um but i just i i know there's a strong connection there and that's and it is true to do the work and with no there's no self-importance there whatsoever it just it's just like it's just what it is like we're here to do and to spread and to and to like get out our little beacon when we can you know to be like hey <laughs> there's a whole other world out there mm -hmm. it's important to not get consumed with the one that we see day to day because that's what gets us stuck you know when we're so focused on one right e one equally as important not to get so over fascinated with the other oh yes oh totally it's all balance and everything like everything from our masculine feminine energies everything from our 3d to 5d everything because we live here on earth we have to have our foot in the 3D realm. Like you can't just whew, all the time. You definitely have to have a, a very healthy balance of both, I find. And that's another reason I, pardon? I have a question for you, but I finish that last statement. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I actually initially, initially when I started my curiosity with plant medicine was there to do in a more structured, structured, a few intentional way. I thought that I'd maybe only do it once, but like, obviously that didn't end up happening. Well, it's only at four o'clock and my calls are done. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> much. But yeah, so I, I definitely, I was, I was hoping to just kind of, to not go from one extreme right into utilizing that as my escape rather than drugs and alcohol like I used to use um, and still do occasionally, maybe not drugs, but alcohol. Um, but, and then transferring it just over to something else to me that just, I was like, no, I don't want to do that. So I was being pretty adamant to continue with a balance. And so what were you going to ask? Sorry. When did you begin to feel 
comfortable with your decision to be here? Hmm, that's a good question. I'm not sure I was ever really uncomfortable with my decision to be here. Not really entirely sure. I like there's always a part of me that's just kind of rolled through this whole life with a lot of acceptance. Like just I don't know if it was me being comfortable, but just like me accepting that, hey, like I'm this this is my current situation in life and and I'm here. Accept it. I guess maybe it was all the moving around I did. If that's in the context that you meant the question. Yeah. Yeah. I had, um, it, was, it came to mind. I was thinking about, you know, my, my own reconciliation with being fascinated with what's out there. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the difference between, you know, putting on an eye mask if you're doing DMT, yeah. uh, or you're wandering around without the, doing the inner journey. Um, but last night I was, when I was laying in bed, I, I went back to the scenario that had happened and it wasn't in, uh, in a non-ordinary state of consciousness, so to speak, we're doing holotropic breathing in water. Mm. And what came up for me as I was being held and then my arms get contorted and I'm, I'm going through it as I had seen this brilliant silver orb and then here comes Chris. I'm just, I'm flying. Like, yeah, I'm going to earth. Like, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. I'm pick it all up. And then as I get closer to the, the silver orb, which at the time it is like, okay, I'm going to earth and I get closer and I see like shadows on the inside of the silver orb, almost like humanoid figures. And then I was like, no, 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 I don't want to do this. I'm not, I'm not. resistance. Yeah. <laughs> the, you know, the, uh, the experience of going through the birth canal and it's like, okay, like this is, this is hard, right? This is, this is the classroom, if you will. And it's like, okay, so I did choose to be here, you know, in this particular form and in all, all ways. And that's allowed me just a lot of, I've given myself a lot of grace and compassion and, and understanding like, sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. I fucked that up. Well, that's okay. We all just. <laughs> Acceptance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's uh, where we have to fuck up. If we didn't, we wouldn't be having the human experience and we wouldn't be learning anything and we would just continue on just with our head up our ass. So like really <laughs> fuck ups are an omen and they are the pathway to our own growth. So I'm okay. grateful for all of mine and I've had a lot, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, no, I, I think acceptance, I don't know, maybe an internal like knowing and acceptance for me personally. And but the same goes when I'm flipping in the other direction as well. And in fact, when I was at ceremony last weekend, I had a friend who was there and I and I guess um, he he's mentioned this to me before, but I didn't really think much of it. And we've ceremonied a couple of times together. But he was like, you just really like you get into it and there's no resistance. He's like, you are like everyone else is fighting it. They're getting up. They're like moving or pacing. And I'm like, no one else just lays there like the entire time. I was like blown away. I'm like, I'm just like out every time and just like complete surrender. And I thought that's like because my eyes are closed. I can't tell what's going on around me for a good few hours. Like the first time I went to ceremony, I brought my face mask. Like I brought it, I was like ready. And she was like, wow, you're really ready to journey. And I saw no one else had one. I was like, I'll just put this away. <laughs> Cause like I've, I've been going like tripping out since I was like a kid. So for me, it was, it seemed intentional. So I wouldn't, you know, but I realized I didn't even need it because I just, my body and my, like everything was so ready to take what I've all, all like done and use it in a more intentional way. So it's like, amazing. That's yeah. yeah. And like even my relationship with LSD relative to the first time I took it, you know, yeah. and I'm going back to, you know, my less than one year in college, um, to now and the relationship and, and the, you know, the sacred nature of these particular molecules, like the last time I did LSD, um, when I was here in my office and I was like, what's this? fascinating <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally different totally different context and plane it's so funny yeah i've microdosed a couple of times yeah it's interesting and yeah just microdosing or macro depending but when you're in your office i'm assuming you're probably microdosing <laughs> boom, boom. you're like yeah <laughs> it was a saturday that was good if no one was around yeah oh, yeah <laughs> 
Yeah, I've been playing with microdosing Chuma, actually, mostly just for my ADHD. I think that I have. I don't really know, but I have a hard time focusing. So I'm going to assume that that's what it is. Yeah. Um, But I've just noticed that the dosage to try and figure out what worked for me was a trial and error kind of situation because we don't have anything like your friend's app might have been able to do, you know, like, yeah. So I've, I've considered things, apps like that myself, but can't really promote that because the things that we're doing are exactly yeah, right. right so but what we can talk about is the integration aspect yeah definitely and that's that's really as i was asked recently um to help lead a group here in santa monica mm. and i'm like i don't okay like I, I could do my own integration yeah but who am i to do this work you are yeah connoisseur for sure yeah right <laughs> i um you know i work with certain medicines with certain people um but i was like wow to actually like facilitate a group and, and now we have 24 people signed up so far amazing and so this has not happened yet i'm assuming no, it's not no. happening august 3rd oh okay cool i'm excited and, it goes. you know we just started talking about it but it's not lost on me and because of just different groups that I either facilitate or co-facilitate or attend that what's lacking is integration. Integration. It's very true, actually. Like we, you know, and they're doing the best that they can, but we get like an email or something afterwards. And it's, um, I personally have my integration process by myself. See, it's working smoothly as, as I, as I like to do it. Um, however, I know, especially for people who've never done any kind of substance before, how shocking it can be. So if you didn't grow up as a teenager running around ripping LSD, like this is a huge shock to the system, you know, it really is. And, and I've witnessed how people come out of it when they've never experienced anything like that. And I think integration is such a necessary part, especially for people who this is brand new for us, like witnessing any visualizations or anything. It's just so unbeknownst to our regular state that I think it's very, very important. Um, And we see a lot, and certainly around here, where somebody has one experience with ayahuasca and next thing you know, they're, you know, they're, they're ready to facilitate, right? They're definitely (laughs) commons or Reiki masters or all the above over the course of a weekend. And there just doesn't seem to be enough space for how do you normalize is not the right word, but how do you then take what your experience was, begin to make sense of it and incorporate that into your reality. Yeah. And that's something. So as I sat with it and it's like, well, if not you, then who? Yeah. Okay. So that's what we'll do. And we'll, we'll create that space, you know, for folks that are here because they're just, you know, it's people will just take something, you know, and when I had, I had experimented with ketamine maybe a year ago and just wanted to try it, like, what is this all about relative to these other things? And I was talking to a friend of mine, he's like, well, I'm going to take ketamine. We go out to clubs and I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't even imagine doing that. <laughs> I had to be at a, a rocking chair in the middle of a dance floor at a music festival <laughs> because of, yeah. yeah, yeah, anyways, but you did it intentionally and with purpose, yes. I'm sure. Uh, yes. How was that experience? I have not done it in that way before. Um, interesting. You know, the disassociative nature is interesting. And what I do like about it is that in an hour you're, you're, you know, you're out through the end door, if you will. Yeah. And I'm comfortable in it. And now that I've led quite a few sessions with it and, and like, okay, here's, here's a good approach and, and what we can do with this particular modality. But for me, in my experience, once I got to a certain point with it and it's like, okay, like there are other things that I prefer, but at least now I have a, an understanding of how powerful this can be for people. Yeah. And I, I enjoy interacting with spirits and entities and I haven't had too many experiences with entities, if you will using that particular medicine. Right. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I think it's more of an internal and Mm -hmm. disassociation, I think helps with PTSD when you need to like remove. Yeah. So that's my understanding. I have a very good doctor friend of mine, Devin Christie, who works at Numinous. Have you heard of the clinic up here in Vancouver? It's getting a lot of recognition all over the world and they are integrating uh, ketamine therapy and MDMA therapy. 
So, and it's just up and coming right now. My girlfriend, Devin Christie's on the board of that. And she's also a Western and Eastern. I believe she's a Chinese or naturopath and a Western doctor as well. And I met her when she was in med school. So we go way back, but to watch the progression of how we're evolving, utilizing these modalities and how integrated to society they're starting to become and become normalized so much so that Western doctors are creating clinics and just like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. the flip side of that coin is, you know, in stripping some of the properties away from this is the difference between an isolate of like cannabis mm -hmm. or full spectrum. And something beautiful happens when it's a full spectrum experience. And I'm not alone in this concern in that, you know, as I mean, uh, if you grow your own psilocybin, you know, a, a powerful dose, 35 cents. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, it's like life altering, like no yes. more, yeah, no well, more antidepressants. You had someone back here last weekend that had never worked with psilocybin before. Um, and I'm not going to say where I was when we were doing this, but, um, it was, you know, it was certainly legal where we were doing it and over a six hour span between that and, um, some hape, um, at the end to put a nice little, you know, bow on the experience. Um, it was, it was incredible power, such a shift and yeah. so humbling to be able to serve in that way. And for me, without treating it as a sacramental meditation. Mm -hmm. My fear is that like many things, and we've seen this and particularly with your indigenous roots, is that when money becomes involved, that we strip away these other properties or aspects that are non-material yeah. and lead to these really profound life changing experiences for people. I don't, we're not going after root cause if we're just giving a pill. There's no integration of prep work. It's like, here, take 0. 0.3 grams of valid concern. But I think that's what clinics like Anemonis are there for is because they're doing, they're doing pre, they're doing post integration. Mm -hmm. They are, they are facilitating therapists with medical doctors and these treatments. So it's like a full scope spectrum. And I think as long as we treat it in that regard and make sure that as much care and appreciation and attention to detail for each person's particular case moving forward. I think there's huge room for growth and expansion. But I think if you're just giving any Joe Blow some MDMA on the side of the road, I mean, for me personally, I have a lot less PTSD from doing MDMA as a kid because of what I was experiencing. It softened a lot of the blows around a lot of the a lot of the things I experienced. So, but at the same time, this is like, I'm not condoning doing MDMA kids. Um, but it's because I, it also put me in a lot of potentially dangerous situations had I been doing it in today's world. Like today's world has definitely got a darker side to the coin than it used to. Like, I feel like doing some of the, being in some of the environments I was in was a bit safer back then, but, but I still, yeah, I still, even with that though, even with the potential of giving it out and not having structure around it for me personally, it benefited me. Um, each case is going to be different, but there's also the potential for it to take a slippery slope. But I think the more conscious we become in combination with that, it, it only has the more easy route for it to go is in that direction. Does that make sense? Okay. So, you know, there is definitely a chance that it might go rare, but <laughs> I think the, uh, the uh, potential for it to go in the proper direction is higher now than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. But. So how do you feel about the human condition? I, mean, I know that we're bumping up against time. Oh yeah. Um, the human condition is still pretty disturbed, um, but it is evolving. And I notice it in my daily converse conversations that I have. I notice it. And, but at the same time, I notice it at both extremes. I think we're at the pendulum swing right now where there is such a, like a huge amount of light, but then there's such a, still a huge amount of darkness. And I, I know there will always be light and dark, but I think that when the pendulum comes down to a bit more stabilized zone within the human condition, that It'll be less extreme. What about you? Re reminded of uh, an experience I had, and I was <laughs> up here with my coworkers, looking at Earth. Actually, it's a pretty powerful story, so I'll, I'll share this. There was um, not ordinary state of consciousness, and I found myself observing the Earth, and I didn't need to look around me to see who else was there, but I knew that they were not human beings, just intuitively. And I was going back and forth 
And I found myself in different countries wearing different costumes, if you will. And as I'm going back and forth, there are these groups of people, you know, like I, one was um, Sudan and another was Oman. And then there was one in the States and I feel like it was like Arkansas, but there was nothing from, a, it was just like an intuitive sense of knowing like six or seven different places as I'm going there in different languages, I would hear I am. So people were just raising their fists, like tens and hundreds of thousands of people. And so as I'm going back and forth, you know, between the, the office. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the other place. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. It was like, I'm not Bob Geldof or Bono or anyone like that. Like, give me something practical that I can use because me leading this effort of a hundred million people into understanding the great I am, if you will, doesn't like, I'm going to fight off that particular form of narcissism. So give me something. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, well, you already do it. You just, when you look people in the eye and you just ask them how they are, mm -hmm. to yep. get the space to see and to be seen. Right. That's something I can do. Yep. <laughs> I went back to the office and watching the earth and you just, you hear and just these different languages, this vibrational frequency of I am, and then we are. So it's like, if I am, then you must be. And so there's, there's need to experience that. But as I'm watching this and then you see like the vibratory quality of Pachimama, and it was like silver and like energy and energy and then. Oh, wow. The entire thing was just gone. And I was like, holy shit, what did we just do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. And you they're know. like, they're like, either way, you know, <laughs> return to light. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. There was a lesson in that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, either way, we return to light. Like, got it. <laughs> so, I can do whatever the F I want. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, kind of, right? As long as it's aligned to the highest. Well, I meant, I meant, yeah, I just meant right. like, like our physical body can kind of like go through whatever and the repercussions is, oh, I go back to light. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that took a lot of pressure off from feeling like I had to do anything or build any sort of programs. It's like, oh, okay, I can just go to the coffee shop and just take 10 minutes and really connect with the barista. Yeah, and <laughs> make sure we'll see it in our like, old space. Yeah, yeah. I, I can do that. that. Yeah. yeah, I love it. You know, so we see these moments of just parents and kids and grandparents. That's why I love airports. Is generally when you're walking out of an airport, people are pretty happy because there's. I, I like to look for people that are connecting with family members they haven't seen in a while, or like those tender little moments. And it's like, yeah, like that makes me feel pretty good about where we are. So if yeah, definitely. far off to the right or the left as things can be, there's a lot of little beautiful moments that happen if we're open to seeing and experiencing them. Absolutely. I agree. And I, and I think also part of our job here is to make those little reminders out because I get emails and messages about, you know, and sent articles and look at the this and that. And I always now I'm just responding with, you know, a part of this is that we are trying to be we're being pushed into a state of fear. It's our choice now whether or not we look at that and acknowledge it or just know that it's there and choose to look in another direction and start manifesting what you'd rather be looking at. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's been my response as of late. And and it's it was challenging to get like to pull myself out of those those moments as well of fear and uncertainty and but once you start understanding that oh that's by design and then you're like no screw that I don't see that <laughs> so there was that for me as well that I was as soon as I realized that that was structured I was like okay well I don't follow structure so it's best that I <laughs> it's best that I do what I'm gonna do and I prefer to look at sparkly shiny beautiful things so yes. that is what I will do yeah. And you know that about yourself, yeah. right? Having that level of awareness is more than enough. Yep. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. This is a delightful conversation. Did you have anything, anything left for the audience that you would like to share? I think if there's one thing to leave the audience, yes, it was piggyback on that story that I shared and that when it comes to mind, you just look someone in the eye, left eye to left eye and just ask them how they are. Perfect. 
I love that. And it's so simple too. And that's something that we can easily do every single day. That's a yes. great note to leave off on. Allow yourself to be seen in return. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is the hard part for me personally, but I have no problem witnessing others. But yes, but we, we learn, we shed, we grow, we evolve, we expand. So all in a matter of step by step, one foot in front of the other, I think. Hey, Madeline. Yep. And so where can my audience find you? Where can they locate you? You have yeah. interesting, beautiful stories. I'm sure they want to hear more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we live in Santa Monica and travel all over the place. Uh, we have some retreats coming up. I'll put those on the website. Um, some of the groups that we do here locally as well. Awesome. My website is chrismccann.co and that's where everything is. And I'm not very active on social media. I'm not very active anywhere else. We're just Perfect. Go on the website. And I will hopefully be making my way back to California now that things are kind of lightening up for now. So I will definitely be in touch with you myself. Maybe come to oh, yes. retreats. That would be so lovely. I would love it so much. Always a place at the fireplace. Amazing. Thank you. And thank you so much to the audience, for everyone who tuned in. If you're watching this on YouTube, please don't forget to like and comment and reach out. Uh, it really helps the channel. And I'm hearing from you guys. And if you're on Spotify and Apple, please don't forget to leave a review because it really helps us to step out. And I love hearing how you're taking all this content. And yeah, I just want to hear from you guys. So thank you so much. And we'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Bye. Thanks again, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> awesome.